So Fallout 76 has been out for two weeks now, and I didn't really want to do a review on release day for a variety of reasons, but I figured, hey, two weeks, that's a good time frame. Let's see what Bethesda does in that time, and maybe, who knows, the game will be phenomenal now. Spoilers, it's not, and I actually think it somehow got slightly worse. So I feel like before going into a video like this, it's important to name my bias, how I am kind of partial to this game. One thing I think is really important for everyone just to keep in mind is what you want to be true, regardless of what actually is true. And for me, I really want and wanted Fallout 76 to succeed. You could even argue I have like a vested interest in its success. If the game does really well, my videos will probably do really well for a longer time, and you could see the correlation there. And yet, despite that, at two weeks later, this is probably like the most disappointed I've ever been in a game company. I guess I'm not often disappointed in companies because I normally don't care, but this one in particular really hits it home for me. So I gave what I would call my then beta review, but now I'll call it my review of Fallout 76 right around when the beta ended. I didn't want to do anything on release day, like give another review then, because I assumed we'd A, have a day one patch that would fix a variety of things, but also I'm sure a bunch of review scores would come out, and I wanted to see those other perspectives, what other people thought of the game, and what kind of experiences they were having. So now I technically got a review code for Fallout 76, but I didn't get any exclusive server time. I could just play the beta the same hours you could even though I didn't have to pay for the game, although I did. I just assume some of those larger publications like IGN, GameSpot, things along those lines actually got exclusive server time, maybe on an updated patch or like a even newer beta build, so they could craft their reviews and have them out for release day. Well, lo and behold, come the release of Fallout 76, it was a ghost town. Yeah, there was nothing in the review spectrum, or like one review by some website no one really ever heard of. So yeah, it turns out that no, those other companies didn't get exclusive review time, and I found that very interesting, mainly because it really popped the question in my head. If if Bethesda felt like Fallout 76 reviews would be super positive, do you think they would have done things the same way? Do you think those companies still wouldn't have had exclusive time to play the game? I imagine you could guess what I'm thinking, but either way, I digress. The real reason I didn't want to do that day one review is I was waiting out for this big day one patch. People were talking about it being 45 gigabytes in size, and I really wanted to see what was changed, what was getting improved. Release day came and went, and what didn't we get? A day one patch. We ended up getting a patch a little while after, but the lack of a day one patch really makes me question, why did we have a beta? Like if you actually look at the game, there's pretty much no difference outside of how many hours in the day you can play the game in between the last like week of the beta and the actual release of the game itself. I remember through all those interviews and even when the beta times were announced, they were like, oh yeah, it's only gonna be some hours during the day, so our dev team has more than enough time to fix a bunch of these issues. Yeah, well, evidently that didn't pan out as expected. Fortunately, as I did mention, we did get a patch after the release, and it was big, and it fixed not that much. Now three patches into Fallout 76, we really don't have a ton of improvements, and I feel like that's what's really shaping my opinion of this game right now. Fallout 76 is one of those games that has issues on multiple fronts. You got the development side where you have a very buggy release, you have the marketing side where you just kind of had some misleading practices or things that seem a little bit sketchy, and then you do finally have the community side, the actual communication between the developers or the people communicating on behalf of the developers and the community. I would say all along the way, the marketing for this game was odd and some would argue deceptive. We had a bunch of gameplay at E3 and then nothing more for three months until a bunch of YouTubers showed you some laggy gameplay. That's exciting, right? You could pre-order the game and play a week early on Xbox One, but in reality only for eight hours. There's a lot more I could talk about on that part, but that's not really the point of this video. Really, following the launch of the game, I feel like we've seen a lot of developments in the development side and the community side. On the development side of things, you can really see that these patches are small and not fixing that much. There are a number of bugs that were present on day one of Fallout 76 that are still present two weeks following its release. Even further, there are a number of bugs that were present on day one of Fallout 4's release that are still present two weeks after Fallout 76's release. A little over three years, and they still haven't been fixed. And I think this is one of the biggest factors in my disappointment and really just the loss of my optimism around this game. I have no doubt that Fallout 76 eventually will be in a fixed and very playable state. I just don't see how that's happening anytime soon. If you look at the three patches we've had thus far, then you would see a handful of fixes while there are a plethora of bugs. Notice the discrepancy between those two terms. There are probably hundreds, if not thousands of bugs for this game, ranging from game breaking to relatively minor and just kind of an oddity or even funny. Yet most of these patches are tackling bugs in the tens. Not exactly the rate you want to see with a game that released in a state like this. And I feel like this is what really took the steam out for Fallout 76, at least for me. Watching the staggering out of these review scores, like 
likely because Bethesda didn't give the companies private time to play the game, probably because they didn't want those review scores out there on release so people would buy the game. Again, pure speculation, but hey, they're dots, I'm just connecting them. Seeing how many bugs are fixed per patch, and even beyond that, seeing how many bugs are in the game. Then you might be like Chu said, how can you say this? But Bethesda just yesterday announced and are communicating with us the two coming patches, what's going to be next on the horizon. And yeah, they definitely look exciting. We're getting some of those quality of life features people were requesting over a month ago. That's great. Yet, I'm still not going to be optimistic. I'm going to assume these patches will hold the same tens of bug fixes and we'll still be left with a game with a plethora and overwhelming amount of bugs. Because I'm really out of optimism to give Bethesda. Disappointment after disappointment. It wasn't like it was just one pronged thing. It wasn't just like, oh, this game released in a buggy state. There's so many more issues than that. Even if you peel everything back, even if Fallout 76 is a perfect bug-free game, you still have all of the issues with the game itself. Then you're left with a mediocre game that isn't buggy, which is that really what we're shooting for here? You don't get me wrong, the game still has a lot of fun components. I definitely have had a lot of fun in my hundred or so hours in it, but I've pretty much reached the point where I have no interest in playing the game anymore. There's still hours and hours of quests and other content for me to actually play through, and I just don't really want to. They're not sucking me in, I don't find them interesting. Now this is partially due to some of the bugs I've encountered along the way, but even beyond that, it's just due to some of the design decisions with the game. Hopefully the DLC does address this, but the way I see it, the DLC is probably months away, and if anything, getting pushed back further to devote more time to actually fixing all of these bugs. To me, it really seems like behind the scenes, the developers of Fallout 76 have a manpower issue. They simply don't have the team size to squash these bugs in a timely manner, and I think that's really going to hurt the game in the long run. Now on the community side, I feel like they are doing a pretty decent job. Communication has been improving, although there certainly still are ups and downs. I like that they're telling us what they're going to be adding in the future, but at the same time, I just imagine these up and coming patches are going to be disappointing for a lot of us. And the community could do a great job at communicating how awesome and how many new features are getting added, but at the same time, if the game's still buggy, the game's still buggy. You can't really communicate your way around that. If the quests are still lackluster, the quests are still lackluster. And all in all, two weeks later, I have more concerns about Fallout 76 in the long term than I did previously. I think when the beta was done and I made that initial review, or even when the game came out, I was super hopeful. I was assuming two weeks down the line, we'd have a lot more bug fixes than we do right now. But at least the way I feel right now is I paid $60 for a game and yet it's not really worth that. Now I'm sat here waiting as they slowly patch this game back to a releasable state all while they hold my money and I couldn't get it back even if I tried. I still do want Fallout 76 to succeed. I hope I'm wrong in this video. I hope Bethesda really turns things around. The next patch is massive, fixing tons of parts about this game. But the reality is, I don't feel that. I don't think that's going to be true. Even though it's only been two weeks, I feel like these two weeks have been very telling about what the future and really the time frame for a working version of Fallout 76 is going to be. And that is multiple months. I'm still going to cover the game, and really more than anything else, I think my point here is that I'm going to be playing this game to make videos on it not for my own enjoyment. As it sits right now, the thing I would like to see the most is Bethesda patch all of the bugs with Fallout 76 and then come 2019, the announced mod support is coming in just a couple of months. I don't think that's going to happen because Bethesda likes money. When you're selling skins and outfits that modders will give you for free, it doesn't really make sense to have mod support until a year after release. And yes, I do truly believe we are getting such a delayed mod support due to that, not just due to the development time. But either way, for me at least, two weeks later, Fallout 76 can continues to be a disappointment, but it somehow, for me, managed to be an even bigger one. I'm still hopeful the game improves in the future, but as of right now, it definitely seems like that's going to take quite a while. So that's pretty sure to wrap it up for the fallout part of this video and my displeasure in it, but let's go into something that I have deep passion for, especially as I'm spending most of my days studying. Psychology, and of course, the psychology fun fact of the day. So in this one, what I want to talk about is your ears, because they're actually pretty cool and probably not as simple as you might initially think. So there's a number of like really cool components to your ears. Like, did you know that your ears are at slightly different tilts? So if a noise is coming from above you, one ear hears it better than the other one. The pinna or the directional part of your ear, like the thing you see on the outside of people's heads, it's like a big funnel. The only role it serves is trying to get auditory stimuli into your ears. One thing you probably have noticed is a difference in your echoic memory versus your iconic or even haptic memory. Specifically, there's a notable discrepancy between iconic memory, that's being how long something you see is kind of stored in your brain, and then echoic memory, which is how long something you hear is stored in your brain. So the way I really utilize this is when I lock my car, I live in an apartment, I have a parking garage I park in, and a lot of times I'm like, wait, did I lock my car? 
car as I'm walking into my apartment. When I think back, I'm never visually looking at myself hitting the key or seeing my car actually flash its backlights as you lock it. Almost always the way I remember if I do is through hearing the sound. And this is mostly due to the discrepancy between our iconic and echoic memory. See with your echoic memory, how long you actually store some of those auditory stimuli, it's quite a bit longer than iconic memory. So typically your brain will store sounds you hear for four to six seconds, depending on which study you're looking at, depending on your age, things like that, which is a fairly long time. Like you can do something, hear it, and then walk away and quite a few seconds later be like, oh yeah, that's what I heard. Maybe think back to what just happened. On the flip side, iconic memory, basically visual stimuli, actually being able to think about what you just saw is typically stored in almost everyone for under one second. It's a very short period of time. So if you've ever had that phenomenon where you could think back and replay a sound you just heard, it's probably because it literally is still stored in your brain. Like you can think of it as a audio file, a .wav file is held in your brain for six or so seconds and you're just replaying it to listen back to what you just heard. So yeah, that's the interesting part about your ears and how your brain processes sounds. As always, again, I thank you for watching. Hopefully you guys enjoyed this video, but with that, I hope to see you all next time. Later.